This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Every year, songbirds across the United States make the arduous journey south to warmer winter climates. They migrate hundreds, if not thousands of miles, occasionally braving tough terrain and nasty weather. Animals time many of their behaviors to coincide with features of the environment, and as the timing of food resources changes, impacts to migration patterns are being seen. We are joined by Kara Delmore, Assistant Professor of Biology at Texas A&M University, who's revealing new insights into songbird migration. Professor Delmore, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to start with a little bit of background, and I want to know, how did you first get interested in songbirds? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. It's one I get all the time. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not actually specifically interested in songbirds. So um, I would actually consider myself an evolutionary biologist. I really love hybrids, um, and hybrids occur in most taxonomic groups, and songbirds is what I study now. But actually, originally, I wanted to be a primatologist. So I actually have a degree in primatology, and I studied a hybrid zone between lemurs. Um, when I first got into research. So yeah, it's a little bit more difficult to work with uh, primates in Madagascar. So I transitioned to songbirds, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a bird nerd. <laughs> Interesting. So, so despite not being a bird nerd, we're going to get into some very bird nerd kind of territory today. How do birds know when to migrate? What, what kind of environmental food impacts, what triggers them to know that it's time to go? Yeah, it's a pretty crazy phenomenon, right? Like all these organisms just like at some point during the year, they decide, all right, let's migrate north or let's migrate south, right? Um, and I think it's a combination of environmental and genetic cues. Um, so for instance, when the birds are down south and it's time to come north for the breeding season, they're likely cueing in on the fact that the days are getting longer and it's getting warmer. And those environmental cues cause them to leave, to migrate north. Um, and the opposite when they're coming back down south, you know, the days are getting shorter, it's getting colder, they've already bred, um, the horm hormones are changing, and so they start migrating south. So it's just a combination of environmental cues that tell them when to go. So you mentioned genetic cues. Is that the hormonal re release? What, what would be a genetic cue? Yeah, that's a really great question. That's the question that kind of drives a lot of the work that's in my lab right now. So um, it's interesting. So migration is actually what we consider a syndrome where in order to migrate successfully, you need to not only know when to go, but also where to go, how far to go. You have to have the right wings. You have to put fat on at the right time, muscle on at the right time. And so we're still really trying to track down all the genes that control this syndrome and understand how they actually integrate with one another. So if I'm, a, if I'm a bird that needs to migrate across a really long distance, my genes need to tell me to go that distance, and I also have to have the right wings. And, and if I don't have those two combinations, then my fitness is going to be pretty low. So how does it all coordinate is the question we're still trying to answer. And they might migrate as far as continents, correct? Like That's right. Thousands and thousands of miles. Like It can be a really big scale here. What we're talking yeah, about. pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so moving into the study that is the base of the paper that brought you to our attention or my attention, can you tell me what kind of species you were working with and broadly where? Yeah, so the paper you're referring to, we study um, a Splainson's thrush. So it's a small songbird. It's, it's about 30 grams. It's not the most flashy of songbirds. It kind of has a speckled, speckled chest and it's just brown. Basically, but they do have a really unique song. You actually often hear swings and thrushes in the background of movies because they have a very um, beautiful song. But beyond that, the Swainsons, they there's two subspecies of Swainsons and they hybridize in Western North America. And so a lot of our work actually takes place in British Columbia, um, where the two taxa overlap during the breeding season. Um, how do you collect data? How do you study them? Yeah, well, there's lots of things we do with them. Um, in the study you're referring to, we were actually tracking these guys on migration. So from their breeding grounds, through their stopover sites, all the way to their wintering grounds and back. And in order to do that, we catch them on their breeding grounds. So we drive into the forest, we listen for males on their territories. Once we find males on their territories, the so singing, we set up a mist net, which is about six meters um, long or wide. And we play the song of another male in that male's territory. He gets upset about that. He hits a misnet. 
we take him out and then we attach a migration tracking tag to him. And we use a few different approaches for tracking, um, but basically all of them, um, in order to to work with all of them, we use a backpack to attach it to the bird. So it's like a little thing that goes around its legs and then it sits on the back of the bird um, for a year, basically. Uh, how far south is their wintering ground? Yeah, so there's two subspecies, like I said. There's the coastal subspecies that migrate shorter distances just to southern Mexico and Central America. And then there's also an inland subspecies that migrate longer distances um, all the way down to um, mm. Venezuela. Wow. Uh, so in your study, part of it, you're talking about different routes, the hybrid routes and the parental routes. Can you tell us a little bit about what those are? Yeah, so the reason we got excited about the Swains and Stresh is because they have those two subspecies that take very different routes on migration. Like I said, the coastal one kind of hugs the western coast of North America, ultimately wintering in Mexico and Central America. The inland one takes a more southeastern route going through the central United States down to South America. So they kind of have these very divergent routes. And then we've got these hybrids, so these birds that have genes from both of these subspecies. What we find with the hybrids is they actually take very intermediate routes to the pure form. So instead of going south or southeast, they take a straight shot between those um, two routes, and they tend to end up somewhere in Central America. But we don't have as much resolution on the wintering grounds as we do on the breeding grounds. Interesting. Um, is is when you're a kind of at the all right? Let me formulate this idea. So. Th- Thinking about catching the hybrid ones in their breeding ground, is there visually anything different about it? Like, does does their markings change a little bit? Or is it really just from the data you can tell that they're hybrid? Yeah, I mean, I wish that it was easy to identify hybrids in the hand. I wish there was a phenotypic trait that we could use. But with the Swainies, they're basically just brown. One subspecies is technically more russet and the other more olive. Um, But I can't tell by eye. Although we do... Sometimes we bring birds into captivity and we only want to bring hybrids. And so we do have a quick genetic assay that we can do in the field that takes us about 24 hours um, to identify individuals that have genetic loci that are from both subspecies. So within 24 hours, if you don't sleep a whole lot, you can genetically identify hybrids. But yeah, no outward trait that we can use, unfortunately. So I I know there's a difference between the adults and the juveniles when they're migrating on how well they deal with weather, mountain ranges, this kind of thing. What kind of intra- information do you have about the survival rates and how they do at different ages? Yeah, I mean, we know like baseline before any of the work that we did that juveniles tend to survive at much lower rates than adults do. So when we're catching birds on fall migration, most of those individuals are juveniles. Um, you know, I think like 10% of the individuals we catch are probably adults because there's just so many juveniles in the population at that time. When they're coming back, most of them are adults. So most of those juveniles have died, more than 50%. Um, and basically what we were doing in this study is we were testing, well, there's an idea, basically, there's been an idea in the literature for a long time that when you have these hybrids that take these intermediate routes, they'll end up actually surviving at lower rates than the pure forms because they'll end up going over all kinds of barriers that the pure forms are avoiding. So those two routes I was describing where the coastal form is taking the western route and the inland more southeastern, they're kind of like avoiding huge mountain chains in the western North America and deserts. And so for a long time, we've been predicting that hybrid Swainies will end up going over those barriers and dying. Um, and that's actually ended up being what we found. So we found that hybrid Swainies survived at lower rates than the pure forms. Um, in our system. So it's not necessarily a juvenile adult thing. It's, um, are you a pure form or are you a hybrid form? How does migration impact bird evolution? Yeah, I think it has a huge impact, right? I mean, it's a pretty major stage in their life history that involves all kinds of morphological and physiological and behavioral changes. So, you know, there's all kinds of adaptations that are associated with the ability to migrate in birds. Um, you know, like I said, they have longer wings, um, they put fat on, they put muscle on, they actually regress some of their organs in order to migrate. So there's all kinds of adaptations that birds have to migrate. And so that's one way that a migration has affected evolution. 
Um, but in our lab, we're actually more interested in the observation that a lot of variation in migratory behavior exists in the natural world. So I keep telling you, right, that we've got these two subspecies, one goes left and one goes right. They also migrate at different times. So one comes back earlier to the breeding grounds than the other. And we think that these kinds of differences in this behavioral trait could be helping to maintain species boundaries. Um, so I already mentioned that we think that hybrids survive at lower rates than pure forms because they take on all these barriers that the pure forms are avoiding, right? And so you have these two pure, pure, pure forms. They're hybridizing. They're producing offspring of mixed ancestry. And that could be bad for the subspecies boundaries, right? They could end up exchanging genes and just merge into a single unit. But what we think is happening here is that the hybrids actually survive at lower rates. And so it doesn't matter that they're technically exchanging genes, their offspring aren't making it. And so that's another way that migration can influence evolution by helping to maintain species boundaries. Do they travel in groups or are they more on their own? Yeah, really great, great question. Um, so the Swainsons is a songbird and most songbirds migrate alone and at night. Um, so they go from being diurnal to being completely nocturnal during the migratory season. And it's thought that they migrate at night. So, um, sorry, alone. Um, so it's not kind of like the classic when you were a kid, you saw the geese flying in a V formation down right. south, right? Those guys are diurnal. They're probably learning from adults where they should migrate. Um, so there's probably less of a genetic component to migration in those kinds of systems. And that's why we study the Slaney, because we know they migrate alone and at night. And we're really interested in tracking down the genes that tell them where and when to go. Wow. Um, thinking about the backpacks and having to catch them when they came back, what kind of percentages were you able to recover even? Um, so we, with the Slaney's, we generally aim for 25 to 30% recovery. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, so it's, it's like we talk about how them, th they were dying off on the way. I was just curious how many actually made it back. Like when you're taking the time to capture them all, like, that's crazy. Yeah. That and then some of them will come back, but they, you know, last time they saw us, they got caught and got a backpack. And so they can be very difficult like, nope. to capture. <laughs> <laughs> so it can take like up to a week to capture one bird, just putting a bunch of nets in his territory and praying, basically. Special thanks to Kara Delmore. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.